Here we are, back again. Huh. It's the Painfully Honest Tech Podcast. The podcast so honest it hurts. And this is the place where we go and we do all the things. We talk about the tech. We talk about, you know, whatever it is that we feel like talking about. And we're back again today to discuss the OnePlus 12. We're going to talk about that today. But also, you know, there's been some other big, uh, I guess, pre- order releases of other topic of other products out there you got the got the world hanging on a string and such. I, heard, I heard samsung or i think that's their name i think they put out a new phone or two yep. or three yeah they, they they've got some some new something going on and then also uh that, that fruit company has that released a fruit company they have they've released a speculative device that uh you're either totally excited about and willing to spend as much as you would on a decent used car or or don't care or you can find that down in the description put out a video earlier this week because i was gonna buy one and and i had some second thoughts so we'll talk about that stuff later but first let's talk about this this one plus 12 phone yes. not not sponsored by one plus they just happen to like us enough to send us yeah a phone and you know what and, I, I gotta say something real quick Okay. I am grateful that OnePlus sent us these phones because it's nice whenever you have phone brands that respect the way that you do work and don't care what you say about their product. They just want you to test it out and give your honest thoughts and feelings on it. So whenever companies like to send us stuff, despite our very honest and sometimes painful approach to things, uh, they still want yes. to work with us. I like that. It's, it is a good thing. I, I appreciate it as well. You know, and well, we could go into a whole thing about how if you're one of the market segment leaders, you should not perhaps be so tender in the butt region, but here we are. Uh, there are some tender butts out there in the tech world. Uh, uh, apparently, apparently, I, I I don't know. I've heard rumor. Yeah. So OnePlus sent, sent us both these phones. And so if you're not familiar with the OnePlus nomenclature, they have their numbered phones that come out each year. Uh, so this is last year was one plus 11. This is one plus 12. Uh, it, you, it's not a math problem. It's just the name. And I have to admit, like, excuse me, I I've been following one plus and using their phones for quite a while. They've always been kind of like, Hey, that's pretty good for a cheap phone. But mm -hmm. then they, they kind of have stepped up their game a little bit. And this one plus 12. 12 has a spe even compared to like the new samsung phone that had that has been announced and is in pre-order right now that are pretty impressive oh yeah snapdragon 8 generation 3 it's got a ltpo 120 hertz display 4500 nits maximum brightness and that that is just absolutely insane yeah that's like look into an eclipse level. Yeah, it's like you look at it, like the sun's out and like your phone's going to be like almost brighter than the sun. Like you have to look at the sun to get some relief from your phone screen. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, and the thing, so I don't ever need like the full amount of nits with my phone because I'm usually like inside so in a dark place. You would say that you're not nitpicky with your nits. I'm not very nitpicky with my nits. I think... I think if I can get like 800 to 1,000 nits. Hey, once, once we got to 1,000, I was like, man, 1,000 is, is pretty good. I mean, I feel pretty adequate with that. Now, a lot of people focus on that number. And, and when you look at that number, that's only with like auto brightness on out in the bright sun, it will automatically adjust that high so you can see your screen better. The HBM, which is weird to me because it means high max brightness, but the B and the M are reversed, is 1,600 nits, which, which is very, right. very good. Like, that's almost what the peak brightness was for, let's say, the iPhone and the S23 Ultra last year. So I'll be mean, getting very close to that. So uh, yeah, Quad HD Plus starts off 256 and 12 gigs of RAM. Uh, and right now, if you decide that you want to buy one or pre-order one, they're giving you the free storage upgrade. So yep. they bumped the price up to $799. So it's $100 extra this year. But if you pre-order it, you can get the 512 16 gig of RAM model. Uh, and OnePlus is doing a thing. They did this with the OnePlus Open, which I thought was interesting. You can trade in any phone, any condition, <laughs> and they will give you $100 off. So effectively, it nullifies that price increase. You like go find an old Nokia brick and they'll give you 100 bucks for it. Huh, interesting. Yeah, no, I mean, I think, you know, they their trade-in stuff isn't nearly as, as aggressive as Samsung's is. But no, then again, but I, yeah, <laughs> Samsung's doing uh, Samsung's cooking books a little bit uh, with their with their upgrade 
program. And we can talk about that when we get to Samsung. But the thing that's impressed me about this is screen looks great. It's got uh, 16 gigs of RAM I was impressed with. It's It's got the physical switch for mute and and uh, vibrate and all that kind of stuff, which is a OnePlus thing. Moved it to the left side, though. Like it's, they did. Historically, been on the right. It's moved to the left. And let's let me get your thoughts on this. Uh, I like the way the camera module looks like I think it looks nice I like think it looks really cool and some really hate the way it looks but I've I'm quite a fan of it actually I think it kind of stands out and looks unique and well the cameras are pretty good well I mean this is very similar to what we saw in the OnePlus open and I think when you're gonna have like four giant lenses like this it's just there's not really all that much that to make it like look the only thing that I would prefer is I would like it to be centered. Like I get the way they do it with this mm -hmm. housing and the way that everything kind of goes together. I mean, it looks nice. If it were centered, kind of like it is uh, with yeah. OnePlus Open, uh, I think people would probably like it a little more. It's just historically with the way things are moved around inside the phones, it's on the left side. So I'm like, eh. Yeah, I, I'll agree with that. But if you kind of look at it on an angle, you can see the depth of some of these lenses is, uh, it, it, it needs a little bit of space to, to get in there. Like the periscope lens that's in there needs, needs some space to exist. So it probably wasn't easy to place them in a, in an aesthetically pleasing place but again like and i think the first massive camera bump we got was with the no no the note 10 plus was actually fine it was the s i think it was the s20 and the note like the note 20 ultra had a really big camera bar on the back of it yeah yeah once we once we've gotten several models past that it's kind of like well i mean it's not ideal let's let's just admit that it's not ideal it's not have, ideal like, but i do like the way it looks yeah i think they've done some something decent with it uh, it does sort of unbalance the phone a little bit, but not not as much actually as the iPhone. Like I'm pu I'm sort of pressing down on it. Like if I were to put it on the desk to want to interact with the phone, right? Yeah. And iPhones, because their camera bump is on the back left, it always seems to be a little bit more, or they're on the back right as well. But the, it it always just seems a little bit more unbalanced. I don't know. Yeah, and then the other thing too, there's one really nice feature that I like. They came out with this thing with the screen and I can't remember their terminology for it, but basically the screen will work even though you get water all over it. Yeah, that's it's, and it's called Aqua Touch. And yeah. the thing that's nice about that is I know a lot of people maybe take their phone into the shower or into the bathroom with the, you know, like when they're getting ready in the morning, they use their phone to do whatever they're doing in the bathroom. And, uh, and so if you're going to be getting the phone wet, then it's, it is nice to be able to, to interact with it and not have to fumble around. So that's really nice. But the one thing that I've, that's just kind of, so I've been using the iPhone almost exclusively since the, since the iPhone 15 pro came out mm -hmm. and y'all have to excuse me. I came back from CES with some COVID, but it's just, uh, it's just getting its, you know, it's getting its last little bits out. So I'll try and mute as often as I can. Uh, but anyway, I mean, just the overall smoothness of using the phone is is really pleasurable. And uh, I don't know if I don't know how you feel about it compared to some of the other Android devices that that you've had more experience with. Uh, I'm a big fan. So I really enjoyed the OnePlus 11 this last year. I recommended it to a lot of people. I thought they did a great job with it. And then this is just kind of a follow on to 100%. And then the charger that the wireless charger that they sell separately will do 55 and uh, they've overall got like a really nice package of accessories i got the one plus buds three sent to me as well i'm gonna be checking those out here you're supposed to send me those but they did not so i'll have to, I'll have to rely on your video well I, I just got them yesterday so they may still be on the way but yeah it's i knew i was getting stuff from them and the phone kind of came last week and then these things came yesterday and I didn't know when to expect them. So yeah, a nice package of accessories going on. I have to admit, like you've got the black model. I've got this green, they say in the press kit that it's uh, inspired by like ice flows or something. It's sort of a marbled look. The texture of it, the feel of it is nice, but the look of it to me is is just not really like, it's not my thing, you know, kind of kind of has this marbly texture. And uh, yeah, it, and it's kind of the same green that they had last year with the OnePlus tablet. And there was a, a green, a similar green with the OnePlus Open. And it's, 
you know, it's not six a half one, you know, a half dozen of the other. So it's, but it, it is a nice texture. And it's funny how so many of these phones, like, they have the matte te mat texture too. Yeah. Although I don't know if it's the same because it's very fine. Because my, mine is it's pretty fine texturing. It looks a lot like their old sandstone case. Right. I know it's hard to see with this dirt quality webcam, but it feels nice. But the problem is it is slick as the Dickens, man. Like I worry about dropping this all the time. So uh, I do like it though. So, but I, I, if you do buy one, I firmly recommend getting a case for it, which will cover its beauty. Cause I think it is a sharp looking phone. And I, I like they kind of held on to a few things because with the new S24 Ultra, no more curved edge display. These guys held on to the curved edge display, which I like ergonomically because you get those rounded edges which makes right. for a, a more rounded edge so you can hold on to it and your thumb can reach the middle of the screen more easily right. than a blocky phone. So uh, I, I respect what they've done with it, but I also like it's $500 cheaper than the S24 Ultra. And I, I don't have the S24 Ultra yes, yet, so I can't make a firm comparison, but I can firmly say that you get probably 95% the same experience for $500 less. Yeah, in fact, I believe that the S24 ultra in the 512 gigabyte configuration is still only 12 gigabytes of ram yes I... they're all 12. 12, so 12 12 yeah no 16. you get a little bit more juice with this one the well, one this, thing that i see. was surprised about so we've got uh usf 4 uh storage yeah. which i don't know when is that like brand new speed because I know so UFS the thing for, for quite a while. Yeah, so we had UFS 3, then we had 3.1. 4 has been like the flagship, like top end standard with Samsung and OnePlus like the last, I think this is like the second year they've been incorporating right. it. And it does make a difference. It's supposed to be like 30% faster, 50% less power requirements. Like it's just all around better, uh, more better when it comes to that stuff. So, uh, and don't quote me on those numbers, but I believe that's, pretty close but anyway yeah it's nice you get it's super zippy fast uh one thing i do like about the software is you can have up to I believe it's six active apps open running in the background for up to 72 hours and it will not close them so if you have a certain app that you like to use all the time and it will like use its internal ai stuff to kind of figure out which ones you right. use and if you, yeah, you can have six. So like yeah. you can leave your bank app, you know, just there's yeah. like, that, that's pretty crazy to me because that's been kind of a staple of Android for the longest time. Uh, very, very harsh with the memory management where it's like, it'll keep that window shell open, but it'll right. have to reload the app when you go back to it. So whatever right. I was reading about it and then experienced it, I'm like, man, this is, this is nice. Yeah, I agree. I mean, now the Snapdragon 8 Gen 3 has, I guess it's almost like their neural processing engine is almost a hundred times more powerful than the previous neural processing engine that was in there. And that's, I guess, what, what sort of allows for the AI to flourish, if I understand correctly. And uh, so I know that Samsung has been tout touting their new AI. Uh, mm -hmm. I, there ha there's not as much AI discussed, at least not in that context here. No, but it's not. They didn't really put much of an emphasis on that. But the thing is, is I don't think that that's the end of the world because Samsung has put a major emphasis on it, like AI, AI, AI for everybody, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And then it shows up and you're like, that's it. That's what you made a fuss about. So right. I still think if you can't do it right, uh, we're still kind of in the infantile stages for integration. And the thing is, is like maybe it'll get Google Bard support once that's integrated with Google. It's just like there's going to be some Google AI stuff that trickles down to it anyway by proxy, right. like over time and stuff that's baked into Android. So uh, I don't ding them really much for that. Yeah. Because one, that's not what they're trying to be. They just want to give you the best flagship experience you can get. Good camera, good performance. They're, they're advertising two days of battery. Uh, and, well, they bumped up the battery to 5,400 milliamps. So I have never tried really to push a phone to two days because I always plug my phone in at night. So maybe maybe you could make it go the distance. If you use your phone maybe four hours of screen on time a day, which I think is pretty reasonable for most folks, you could probably right. squeak two days out of it. And I can say that I'd gotten it down to about 40% over the past five days of just mm -hmm. kind of just kind of using it lightly standby time had dropped very it, it had dropped very little mm -hmm. so i was getting actual like 
almost real time battery use out of it as opposed to like you charge it to 100 you pick it up the next day it's at like 80 you know well that was particularly bad like with some phones like the pixel 6 had really bad standby time the s22 ultra like the s22 series had bad standby time uh, and what made me by saying the battery percentage is going down when you're not using it so the standby time i did so i did a test with this i actually charged it a few days ago and didn't touch it and i had it in airplane mode and i came back and it was still on like 100 yeah. percent. i was like this is really impressive yeah and i should qualify too that i don't have a sim card in this so the antenna is not like constantly searching for a signal you know it's just on wi-fi so so that might impact battery use a little bit but overall i mean android battery management has gotten a lot better and and supposedly since what android 12 or so uh the battery management is kind of dynamic and that it senses the, it starts to sense the, sense the way you use it kind of does a little bit more as time goes on i know it does that with uh with the brightness as well yeah so that that's the adaptive features and that's that's with any android phone and i always tell people don't base your battery usage on the first 72 hours of this phone right <laughs> anytime you get an android phone because one the adaptive battery takes typically about a week to kick in yep. but like the first two or three days the first two days of 48 hours are the harshest like you're setting everything up you're downloading everything it's just running all the background data galore like it's not learned any of your usage patterns yet so the window of of battery life that you get the first two days versus like a week later after some of those features start to kick in it does make a difference yeah no that's that's true and i i mean having been covering phones now for low these many years it used to be that you would charge it up on the first couple of days and you know the thought was oh the battery needs to like break in a little bit or something but after a couple <laughs> of days you could kind of you could kind of sense what your battery life was going to be like but especially with android phones now it, it just really i've i've noticed that it can sometimes take up to two weeks to really kind of settle into my patterns as i use an android phone but then it's typically pretty good the one thing that i think you know i when i use an iphone there are a couple of things that i always notice when i then go pick up an android phone the brightness auto brightness sensor is like way too sensitive in mm -hmm. an android phone at first and it's yes. like it's like because i do use my phone a lot like in bed in the dark and i'll usually like pull the the brightness down quite a bit but you, you know it's, wear your sunglasses at night uh no <laughs> I, I don't i was gonna quote the song even more but i thought no no i don't i, I shouldn't do that uh because that would show how much of a dork i am i'll not tempt uh, you with 80s music lyrics anymore yeah man uh, that was that was seventh grade to eighth grade that song came out Woo! yeah it's a big one that summer it was a big hit. yeah old Corey hart canada's heartthrob no pun intended but yeah so i have but when, when i'm using an iphone i think that ios because the, the if when you go from one device to the next the hardware is similar enough that ios sort of a lot of the data that they have about you and your account and it doesn't have as much of an adjustment period i guess mm -hmm. or at least it yeah, feels like of, it feels that way to me iphone supposedly uh for the most part you what you see is what you get like you once you go through like the first day and you install and set everything up and recharge it to 100 percent, that's kind of at least from my understanding like it's just supposed to work like it doesn't yeah. have to do all the other stuff but I, i'm sure some of that carries over too like i'm sure that there is pattern Beha sensing behavior and all sorts of things but a lot of times probably i mean i don't want to throw useless statistics out there but probably the majority of folks that buy an iphone previously had one so when you restore from your backup it's right. essentially like it already knows all that stuff yeah whereas you know the, the reason that that matters as opposed to an android phone is that like you know i might be using a samsung and then using a oneplus phone and even though they're relatively similar, they might be using the same chipset and everything else. They're not the same devices, so you yeah, can't. Or you could switch to a Motorola, whatever. Yeah. So Google can't like save that data and just roll it over to the next device that you use because it might be something entirely different. So, so yeah. But one thing that so I guess my question is: now we're starting to get into that season of we've got the S twenty four coming out, One Plus is coming out. There's going to be phones coming out throughout the year. And, and OnePlus, I feel like, struggled 
for a couple of years there as they decided like, hey, we're going to try and compete with with the big boys and charge like a bunch of money for our phones. So that it, was the OnePlus 9 series, which yeah. was not received very well. And it's like, you want me to pay a thousand for this? Like OnePlus is, look, I'm not saying the phone wasn't worth a thousand dollars, but when you look at phones and you're already like, people are frustrated about a thousand dollar iPhone, a thousand dollar Samsung. I just don't think that the com like your everyday man looked at a OnePlus phone and said, that's a thousand dollar phone. Like there's not that level of value associated with that price tag. Excuse me. And the thing is like, so when I look at this phone though, and, th and I guess the one thing that kind of surprised me as I was, when I looked at the OnePlus open, and then now that I, I'm looking at the, the OnePlus 12 is that you're not really giving anything up going from a Samsung to a OnePlus phone. I mean, um, there are a few things like, the s pen of course if you're an s pen fan you're probably not going to want to leave samsung for OnePlus. uh if you use dex i mean that's still very exclusive to yeah. samsung but outside of the s pen and outside of dex there's not like now they have the seven years of support so yeah. it'll be curious i thought OnePlus might would bump that up i would have liked to have seen them move to my i think the most meaningful support for a phone right now is five years if yeah. they did five years of operating system updates, five years of security patches, I think that would be fine. Now, we get four years of operating system updates, five years of bi-monthly security patches. I'd really like to see OnePlus take that next step and go to monthly yeah. because, I mean, Apple essentially does them monthly. They do them as needed, but that's all the time. Samsung does monthly. Google does monthly. So I feel like that's kind of the next frontier that OnePlus needs to tackle is providing that level of support. But I mean... I think seven years is more of like to selling marketing verbiage. Here's the thing about seven years. And I was thinking about this as I was thinking about Samsung's now offering that. And, and Google came out with that with their with the Google 8 phones and uh, or the Pixel 8 phones. And you just got that. Yeah. Well, not before, but okay. you know, nobody's going to keep a phone for seven years. Like, well, like, here's the thing. You're, I, I'm going to I'm going to cut off the two angry people in the comments section already. When we say nobody, we mean as a general whole, most people are not hanging on to their phones for that long. But I don't see the benefit. I know you could pass one down, like you could hand it to somebody else. But once you get that far, like seven years ago was like the Samsung Galaxy S8. I know there's a few people out there still using one. I don't think it's a great idea. It doesn't have security patches anymore. I mean, so historically, you wouldn't get a phone supported that long. But just looking where we were at seven years ago and then taking into consideration most of these phones, like a Pixel or a Samsung, a lot of times when the new phones come out, like two or three years later, you can trade it back into your carrier and get a new one for free. So why would you hold on to it that long when you yeah. could just get another one? I, seven years seems like kind of a number that Samsung and Google can throw out, and it seems very impressive, but they know that by and large, they will never have to honor it. Have we ever even got, like, I think that Samsung changed their policy to four years, four and five with the S, was it the S10? Maybe. Or so. the S20. Like, we haven't even reached the first phone they've supported for five years yet. So uh, seven years is a long way. Like, where's, what is that at? We're in 2023, 2030. Could yeah. you imagine using the same phone until 2030 and especially the way batteries are like notoriously phones are not great with battery life over the long term we know that samsung batteries kind of have a tendency to start bloating uh, yeah. after a while and i mean especially if they're not used like a lot of people as long as you use them they seem to be fine but i see a lot of folks that pull them out of their drawer and they haven't been used for a year or two and it's like oh the right. battery's busting at the seams so i just don't think the battery technology is there i don't think the benefit really is there at seven years and there's just yeah. i don't know it's a cool thing to say that we support our phone for seven years but i know call me negative nancy but i'm on the, i'm on the skepticism fence we'll see I, I i think that android phones by and large had probably a negative they had a negative image problem when it came to long-term usage of an iphone oh for sure they've been playing catch up for years and so i i think that they felt like now that we can Let's just go ahead and say that we'll support the phone for, you know, seven years. And that will be something that eases the conscience or eases the, the nerves of some people who might be looking at an Android phone versus an iPhone and saying like, oh, you know, well, if this is only going to be good for three years and this iPhone is five years old, then, uh, you know, I, I better go for another iPhone. 
Right. So I well, think I, I think that it's a marketing thing that they hope will help them sort of repair that that image of being. I will say that Samsung has done, and I will give them an immense amount of credit. They have done a huge turnaround over the last two and a half, three years when it comes to their software support. Three or four years ago, people were like, you have to buy a new Samsung phone every year because yeah. after a year, it's bogged down. It sucks. The performance isn't good. You might have to wait six or seven more months to get a software update. You never get security patches. And they went from being a joke in the software yeah. department to, because OnePlus was for years, like the gold standard, like they were Johnny on the spot, got it the first update before everybody else. And Samsung has basically supplanted OnePlus and Google as effectively being the industry leader in software support for Android phones, at least here in the US. And I mean, that I think they've really put a lot into it. So if anybody can support a phone for seven years on the Android side, I would say Samsung can do it. And I think just overall, the hardware and the software itself are mature to the point where, you know, sometimes these companies make their trade-in programs so... So, so so lucrative, so attractive that it you know it doesn't make any sense to keep it you know, so. But one nice thing is you know four or five years ago I I wouldn't even consider like I would not consider using a mid range phone because it was just such a bad experience for the most part, and nowadays phone comp like the basic core competency with these chipsets uh, is so good that yeah I could see that. Seven years from now, most of your apps that you've been using every day for the last five or six years are still going to run just as well. Like Twitter should load just fine. Uh, if you go pick up a seven-year-old phone, there's some pain points and yeah. trying to just load basic apps at points. But with how powerful they are nowadays and how good the software optimization is, most daily functions will probably still work pretty good by then. Yeah, yeah. And I think one thing that folks will be interested in, you know, I still hear relatively often people who refuse to give up whatever phone they have because new phones don't have IR blasters. This if, one if does. Whatever you're going to use it on. Apparently, our, our friend Flossie Carter likes the IR blaster. I, I was not aware of this, but somebody in my comments was like, oh, IR blaster's back. Flossie's going to be happy. I'm like, I mean, cool. I mean, you can use them for certain things. You can control older TVs with them. Like most of them don't use IR anymore, but like air conditioners, like some smart ro like home devices, there are still things that apparently use IR Blaster that uh, I don't use them for, but it's back in there. A lot of stuff that's gone to like, and you know, you don't even have to have a line of sight work your stuff anymore. So it's here uh, for the people who've really wanted it. Uh, we've got dual stereo speakers with Atmos. Dolby, oh, Dolby Atmos. Atmos, yeah, the sound is, pretty good here i i yeah. anything that gets dolby atmos makes me happy because it means there's just that extra level and that's one thing i've applauded samsung for for years especially when it comes to their wireless audio uh, yeah. buds always just sounded better on a samsung than they do with like apple with the aac codec or with like some other android phones i think the one thing that no, people don't talk about enough when it comes to audio in a samsung phone is that it they have had for so many years that personalization testing that you can get you know they they have basic set like settings that you can select if you're like you know younger middle or older age but then you can also do like a personalized test and tune your headphones to like what your ears are actually hearing which mm -hmm. works pretty well honestly and and so not not enough people have really talked about that i've always meant to make a video about it why you know why it matters and how it works but uh yeah the audio experience just like straight out of the phone you know ambient in the room is a lot better than it has been uh you know and, and so i think we've got the dolby atmos we've also got 3d spatial audio yes which also gotta, works with the buds yeah i've got to dig in a little bit and see like how they're describing spatial audio versus Dolby Atmos. Because I know Dolby Atmos is a branded style of audio. sort of immersive audio. Mm -hmm. And so spatial, spatial audio, it's, it's like directional. Like It's basically like kind of adding surround sound. So if, if you've ever like said, used a gaming headset, and if you remember right. like playing video games 10 years ago, it's just all stereo sound, everything all blasting at the same time. And then we got like 5.1 audio, 7.1 audio, those channels give you different layers of the music you can hear kind of in different spots or places. Right. And it just kind of gives you that extra level of immersive audio. So that's built in with this. But then also, 
I tested it out extensively with the OnePlus Buds 2 Pro last year with OnePlus 11. And having that like surround sound kind of atmospheric experience is, is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. And I'm I'm anxious to see what it does with uh, the Buds 3 that, I, mm -hmm. that I've got here. Kind of exciting. And it leads me to a question. This, this wasn't on our docket, but I just want to take a, a little detour into earbuds as a topic. Now, there are a lot of earbuds out there that you can get. There are a lot of earbuds that are sort of more hi-fi. There are a lot of earbuds that are sort of, you know, every man priced. And it used to be that third-party headphones were where the better sound existed, right? Usually and, prices were too. <laughs> yeah, but over the past several years, it seems like, well, first we had the AirPods and then the AirPods mm. Pro. And I think those kind of became, in my, to my estimation, kind of a gold standard for, and the, the question that I have now is, and this kind of, my friend Gameski, who does earbuds, and I know El Jefe uh, also focuses mainly on earbuds for his channel. There's sort of a question of like whether or not there's the, there's a vitality in the earbuds, uh, in the earbuds market the way that there was say three, four, five years ago mm -hmm. and whether or not, or ha has that market sort of shrunk to like more self-selector audiophiles for third party stuff. Meanwhile, you know, you can get a really good pair of earbuds that work really well with your phone of choice from well, the, the manufacturer. I think that's been the big shift. Because if you took a look at earbuds, historically, if they came from the same brand, like if they, like the Samsung Buds when they first came yeah. out, or like the first, uh, like Google Buds or something like, so when they had, when you had branded ones, especially ones that came with phones, notoriously, they were not that great. Right. Like they were cool because they throw them in free and it's like, well, Samsung advertises their Galaxy Buds as being 150 bucks, but you're basically getting them for free. Right. It was kind of like a gimmick, right? Tuned by AKG. Like, yeah, of course, right? <laughs> so they make it seem like you're getting a good deal, so they should be premium because of the price tag that right. nobody pays. But right. then you listen to them and like, man, my $40 earbuds sound better. Right. So there was a lot of this undercurrent where it's like, okay, there's so many good brands of earbuds that you could get at yeah. like the $50, $90 price point that would be as good as two $300 branded ear. You're getting really good earbuds from Samsung, Sony, uh, Google. So like all of the branded ones now kind of settled around that $150, $179 price tag, but they're actually are really good. And that's the thing, like the sweet spot for any kind of wireless headphone has always been in that like $100 to $200 range for the majority mm -hmm. of people who care. Like, yeah, there are always going to be the people who are like, I don't care what it is, you know, as long as it connects to my phone and I can hear something, you know, yeah, go get a $30 pair of J labs. There's nothing wrong with that. Right. But then I think for the people who care, you know, the, the market was what Samsung, et cetera, is offering is not as good at what I can spend a hundred dollars on or $150 on. So I'll, I'll, I'll go and find my selection of those. But yeah, as I you say, that, like, I think, I think that they've just sort of rounded the corner so the headphone market is now like kind of weird because apple pioneered this with the airpods and probably not a lot of people remember this because it's been now since what, the iphone 7 is when the airpods initially came out the original yeah, airpods like eight, eight years ago so that would have been like 2017 i think 2016 2017 and the big thing about the airpods the one really huge pain point of using wireless earbuds beforehand connectivity. was con connectivity staying and staying connected and having decent sound while you were. And, and then secondary was battery life. Yeah. The AirPods kind of knocked that out of the park. Like to be able to open up the, the headphone case and, and it just pops up on your phone. Like I remember the first time I saw that and I was just like, Oh wow. Okay. Well, it was uh, such a pain in the butt. Like, I didn't want to buy my mom wireless earbuds because I'm like, she won't know how to connect them. Or right. they would disconnect or one would become unpaired. So the Wild West of early Bluetooth, that's one thing that I do appreciate Apple pioneering sometimes. Like, there are things that I have been upset that went away, like the floppy disk. I remember whenever I first started seeing computers with no three and a half inch floppy disk, I was like, but how will I just use media? Like if I needed to use a Word document or right. like as a student, it was concerning. And, and then it's like when the CD-ROM left, I was like, man, the CD-ROM's gone. And then now 
that the headphone jack has been gone for years now. I was mad at first. Like the first year, I was pretty mad about it. But now that they have such good wireless earbuds, I don't think we would be at this point if Apple hadn't pulled the plug on the plug. No, and in in hindsight, I mean, I, I still feel like we haven't bridged the gap to audiophile quality listening through Bluetooth, but we're, we're very close at this point. And for the majority of time, like now, even somebody like myself who who's you know kind of a kind of a snob will say like if i'm out and about if i'm traveling or if i'm walking or if i'm you know doing anything besides like sitting and and like appointment listening to music the airpods pro or you know their their sort of counterpart in any other for any other ecosystem are perfectly fine you know and uh, that was the case even with airpods where people could be like yeah you, you know I mean, even reputable headphone listener uh, reputable headphone reviewers were like yeah i mean it's just the way things have changed i mean also as much as you are an audiophile i may be a like semi-audiophile in some regards most of what i listen to on my earbuds is not actually music like i listen to music i'm like at the gym which we can see how long it's been since i've been there but i listen to mostly like youtube podcasts watch movies so like the experience that i get with the convenience and the battery life and also like a lot of the improvements in your buds over the last couple of years, I appreciate not having a cable attached to it. Yeah. And, and I think even though I stayed mad about the headphone jack for a lot longer than most people did. Well, we also still had LG uh, for yeah. most of that adventure. Yeah. Uh, I still appreciate the fact that going and sitting on an airplane, you don't have to worry about like tying yourself up in your headphone cable as well as like your carry on bag Oh and my gosh, co- it used to be the worst, <laughs> man. Like it was the worst. Exactly. Yeah. So I I think that now wireless earbuds have have matured to the point where we've gone from the earbuds that came in the package with the iPod, which were awful by uh, yeah, any stretch of the terrible. imagination. And then those were re- those were still in the box with the original iPhone. Then they redesigned those earpods and earpods, what they're called. Yeah. And Actually, I think the second generation of the earpods sounded a lot better than people gave them credit for. There was a lot of research done on like bass, bass reflex and different kinds of things that did give them a better sound. And that's sort of the platform that the AirPods were built on. We've reached this level of okayness where for the majority of people, it doesn't have to be like $500 good, right? Yeah. And nobody's offering you something for a two hundred dollars that sounds like 50. yeah i think we've reached a pretty good place there so uh yeah I, i'm so, interested to hear what you have to say about those yeah I, i'm gonna i'm gonna start testing them out this evening so i guess my question for you is if you're making a, a purchase decision about a new android phone knowing what we know about now about the one plus 12 who who should consider this is there somebody i guess who sh- who should consider the one plus 12 well, I think this goes back to what I was saying earlier, where there are a few things that really keep some people with the Samsung phones, like especially the Ultra having the S Pen support, people who like Dex, like those things alone are like, obviously, we don't get that experience with this phone. So I think if you like those things, you're squarely in the Samsung camp. This phone, I kind of, I have a lot of value conscious viewers on my channel. Like I, I always talk about value. I talk about uh, what you get for the price and, and equivalencies. And like, I had a phone that I liked a lot. It was the Motorola Think phone that was going for like three ninety nine, And that sucker was amazing. So if you want to get basically a full flagship experience, complete phone, and you don't, you're not an iPhone person and either A, you don't care for Samsung or B, like you don't want to spend a thousand to $1,200, then this offers you a very value oriented flagship experience to where you can have a really good, enjoyable phone that you won't really notice the difference and you don't have to make any compromises. So for people who are not attached to labels, I would say this is a good phone because some people do get wrapped around like, oh, I will only get a Samsung or I will only get an Apple. And not everybody's like that. And there's not a lot of phones out there for those folks. I guess like the killer app for Google has been photography mm. but i will say that i was very impressed with the photos that i got with the one plus open yes and this hasselblad array that they have on 
on the OnePlus 12, these are really good, take really good photos. This is the fourth year of their collaboration. And it's, it's purely for like color science and some of the, like, you know, how the, the colors and the photos actually appear. It's not right. the actual lenses. I have been hoping for years that they would jump into the lens department, but the cameras on this one, I believe are basically the same ones on the open and the open had really good cameras. I took a lot of photo samples with mine that I included in my review I dropped today. And here, here's the thing. Three years ago, I would say, no, I would, if you care about the camera, you're probably going to like kind of steer more towards Samsung or more towards Apple. But the last two years, OnePlus has done some really good things with their cameras and right. they've really stepped up the quality to where it's like, that's kind of the same thing with the competency and the baseline competency with these cameras and the stuff built into Android already with the image right. signal processor and stuff like they're so good. They don't require as much heavy lifting, I guess. So like whenever you take a look at a one plus camera, you're not like, uh, yeah, it's a great phone, but the camera, is, I, I think it takes good pictures. Yeah. I mean, I'm just looking at the specs here. We've got a 50 megapixel wide, wide angle lens. That's uh, a Sony sensor 64 megapixel 3x periscope telephoto and then uh ultra wide with 114 percent field of view the as, as you said like hasselblad uh color science and and other other sort of software enhancements i was i've been very impressed and i'm gonna i'm gonna do some photo comparison uh when i do my review probably you know hopefully that review will be out by the end of the week but i just i think google they i always get a little bit when i start to think about who sits where in the marketplace and you know google has always kind of been their own thing but i kind of feel like this this phone really competes well with say a google pixel 8 pro oh it does but the thing is it's 7.99 like yeah. they bumped the price up on the pixel 8 pro to 9.99 Right, And then the S24 Ultra bumped up to 1299. So you take a look at the S24 Ultra. Okay, good phone. And then you're like, OnePlus 12, good phone. Oh, two to $500 cheaper. I think at that $1,000 price point, it would compete with a Pixel. Mm -hmm. But things that they would have to do in order to do that would not be improvements made on the phone. It would be improvements made or or more money spent in marketing. In the brand image. A bunch of, yeah. So they're definitely in this position where at 7.99 they can sneak in mm -hmm. yeah much like covid it, snuck in on you uh, hate it but yeah overall i think oneplus has done a really good job of kind of rehabilitating their image and yes. and bringing themselves back into a, a solid market space where they were kind of lost there for a couple of years mm. and they're no longer the flagship killer because those flagship killer phones never had like all the specs right mm -hmm. this phone has all the specs yes the only thing that's missing is ip68 like it has ip65 which i mean i think is fine because i don't encourage people to put their phones in submersive like water right. so as long as you don't go jump in the pool with it you're gonna be fine uh, i don't think that ip68 is necessarily like the biggest thing but so they made a they talked about that before because a lot of their phones have not historically had IP68. That's because the certification process to get IP68 basically adds like $100 to the price of the phone. Right. So that's how they help keep the price low. So before they were like, when they did the launch event for the bit. So like, we're say we can't tell you it's IP68, but we saved you $100. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, even though it's IP65, I feel pretty comfortable with the way they've managed and built their phones for the last while that it's probably better than that but i'm still don't throw your phone in the water yeah and i think unless you're somebody who works around water often it's probably not something that the average consumer really has to be all that concerned about unless you're somebody who's like i, I taking baths or going to the pool. i don't know or don't, don't drop in the toilet yeah yeah, not for more than half an hour. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the thing, too. So IP68 means that you can have it submersed in up to a meter and a half of water for up to half an hour. Right. Nothing like this phone, you could probably drop it in the water for a few seconds, pull it out. It'll probably be all right. But yeah. it's not rated to stay underwater for half an hour. Right, right. And so now that we've got this phone and we have we know that we've got the, the S24, and I guess you still count the, the Pixel 8 Pro and the Pixel 8 as current phones because... yeah. Google doesn't necessarily, what, like October-ish is when they come out with their... So they launched their phone at the end of the year, 
So it's really weird because you're like, well, are we comparing it to the S24 Ultra? Because it's a right. 2023 phone, but it comes out right at the end of the year. So it's kind of an ambiguous time, but also Google really is not trying to compete with a Snapdragon 8 Generation 3 phone. They, they've created their own path with their Tensor chip and their AI features, which I think are still better than the Samsung AI. Yeah, so I think the OnePlus has like solidified itself a spot in the in the consideration for Android phones so far this year. Mm-hmm. And, you know, competes competes with the flagship models of the other two in Nor- it now this is North America only because sure there are like 100 other phones out there that, that you can get, but I think that this phone deserves if you're buying an Android phone in the first half of 2020 Four. I agree. So the other big, and I should say that there are links down in the description for uh, their affiliate links. They help out, and uh, but links down in the description for this, and you can check out the S twenty four line of phones and stuff like that. Uh, they do help out the cause of the Painfully Honest Tech podcast and all that kind of stuff. But uh, and usually a little bit better deals than than what you can get just like straight off the straight off the cuff. But we had another big pre-order release this week and we're just let's just talk on, about on, my- on your birthday, uh Apple un- Apple unleashed upon us the pre-order for the Vision Pro. I think that it has the potential to be a transformational paradigm shifting device. I agree. As however, as the <laughs> the pre-order came, you know, in the in the week or so that led up to the pre-orders, I started looking around and hearing from other people, like, what exactly is this thing going to be able to do when I, when you buy it for $3,500 plus tax and lenses? You can watch Apple <laughs> movies. You can no, watch Netflix. no YouTube app, but you can watch YouTube in a browser window. And I, I don't understand this. Like, you would think, like, obviously looking at the Apple Vision Pro, there are a lot of things like... It's a spatial computer. We've seen the illustrations where they're like, you can pull up multiple monitors inside their virtual windows. You can do some multitasking. You can do all sorts of crazy things with it. But when I see a headset, and just like my experience with the, like, the XR glasses, the primary function that most people think about is, man, I can use this and watch like virtual movies and have like a giant movie screen in front of my face. Right. So... You would think YouTube and Netflix would want to be like at the ground level with that. Yeah, which I mean, Netflix does some weird stuff. They 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 make weird decisions. They don't let Apple uh, aggregate their stuff in the Apple TV uh, app with all the rest of the stuff. That's one thing that I like about Apple TV is you're different. You've got your Disney, you've got your Amazon, you've got all these different streaming apps, and they will aggregate like what you've watched and when a new episode or a new sporting event comes up it'll pop it up there it's like hey here's the thing you might want to watch that you've watched before Mm -hmm. netflix doesn't allow them to do that for reasons unknown but netflix is doing their thing the thing that bothered me about the vision pro as it sits right now as i can understand what it has the Uh, potential to be because apple really like they didn't come out and say like here it is here are all the details. They have some vague aspirational marketing language, but when you know, it came for a second there, I didn't think the rest of the word "parational" was going to come after that. Well, <laughs> I, you know, I'm I'm trying to keep it clean for the kids, and I think that they're on the right track. I, I don't like. I get what they're trying to do, and they're trying to put their weight behind it and come out with this product that kind of possibly transition us in the next frontier of uh, engagement and product usage and consumption but man four thousand bucks basically i mean is 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 that it i mean is is that the cost right now to get us on that bus well okay so i, I forget what the, what the, the air twos, i think yeah uh which are the best fitting rogan max yes the best fitting i can wear them over my glasses but they also have adjustments for the the space between your eyes and the and the lenses so I can actually wear my glasses without or wear wear those glasses without my glasses and get a pretty clear picture. Uh, Mm -hmm. I'm nearsighted with astigmatism. So those are the best in terms of like being able to put them on comfortably. And then what I got with my review package was a little handheld Google TV box. Yeah, you can connect it to your TV. 
And so it's basically like if you could take an Apple TV and plug it into your your Vision Pros and watch whatever's on there, right? How much does that device cost? 300 bucks for the glasses. And I think the little handheld Google TV box is like 150 bucks, something like that. I'd have to look. I can't remember. Yeah, it's been may, a definitely not over $500. Right. $500 for something that looks really good. It's not going to look as good as Vision Pro. It's fine. But it looks really good. It's comfortable. It does the thing. It will do virtual screens. Mm -hmm. uh, you can plug it into your, your computer. mirror, your iPhone screen. Now, none of it's not doing it wirelessly. But I tell you what, when I look at like what Vision Pro is advertised as being capable of doing right now, mm -hmm. and I think like for 10% of that money, I can get something else that's pretty decent for a thousand for like 10 like 10 percent of what a vision pro would cost there's nothing yeah. there's nothing about the vision pro that says to me like oh i've got to have i've got to have that other then, than apple fomo so you've also got the external battery that external battery pack that you put in your pocket connects a little cable or whatever it's right. only good for two and a half hours you can like take those off and like have multiples of them i guess but, but I, then, I'm curious, how does that work with the handoff, though? Like, is there enough battery inside the the console itself where it can, does it shut off when you plug in the other battery with that brief disconnection? That's the thing I don't know either. And I do know that if you choose to just have it plugged into a source, it will run without yeah. the battery. Yeah. But that's kind of not the point, right? Yeah, the point is to be untethered. But... There's one other thing that I just wanted to say real quick that like really pisses me off about this. I assumed for the low everyday price of $3,500 that it would have copious amounts of storage considering it's like an all-in-one thing. It's not like, okay, I bought a $700 iPhone. Let me trade it in in two years and get a storage upgrade or whatever. Right. The $3,500 model, $3,500 model, 256 gigabytes of storage right like the engineers at apple smoking some serious rocks on this one well it's, it's like you're wearing a mac mini on your face or a macbook air yeah on your face um a 3500 macbook air that like we're so beyond that with yeah. storage requirements like this is not an iphone 10 it's not an iphone 12 it is a four thousand dollar all-in-one apparatus that goes on your stinking head that yeah. like if you you can't just go down the street and be like oh let me trade it in and get another one and just get because i need the storage upgrade like you're probably stuck with this for years and what kind of future scalability does that give you i mean how much are you going to be storing on the device and how much is going to be off the device being pulled in well i, I just again a question it. that apple didn't address that question in any way shape or form as far as i could tell we didn't no. know what storage. We knew that 256 was going to be the the low end, but we well, had. We just found that out recently. But <laughs> we didn't know until they opened pre-orders that there would be 512 and and one terabyte versions, right? Mm -hmm. So there's so little known about this product. Yeah, and, and, and that's I watched your video, <laughs> and you know we've talked about us with our own concerns, but there's just enough there that gets you excited and there's there's fomo right because they're like oh right. there's only going to be fifty thousand and blah 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 blah. but then when you start looking at it and you go all right i can't do that the battery life is limited i have to buy more battery packs if you want to continue to go untethered there's 256 yep. gigabytes of storage there's extra costs for the lenses there's extra costs like i don't i just could justify that i mean i i had low interest in it anyway because i just have low faith in this first generation one maybe in a year or two i'll buy one if i get it for like two grand and they finally mature the platform because here's the thing even when the iphone first came out it was like you're very limited there's not only yeah. so many apps and yeah. it was the same thing with android it takes time to build up an actual usable expansive library especially for this new form of technology right. so the experience on day one would be like you'll do some cool stuff for a few hours and you're like all right what do i do now yeah it's basically a, it's a demo mm -hmm. you know it le unless something that it does is like the killer app for you but for the most part what it's going to be good at is playing tv shows and videos and movies yes and being able to walk to the fridge and grab another dr pepper <laughs> because you right. can see through the lens. Like I like the level of awareness that you get because the visor will go clear. I've got a Quest 2, we have a Quest 3. Like those are not that great uh, if you need to leave outside your little safety zone. Right. Right. So I I mean again, what it promises 
has huge potential. Yes. But when I started to think like, okay, you know, Monday's coming and I'm going to have to either pony up 4,000 plus dollars or, or not, I, I just couldn't do it. I just couldn't. Like, I, I, I recently bought a truck for my son. He created a yes. lawn mowing business and he needed a truck. So me being the wonderful father that I am, me and his mom, we bought him a truck. And it was a 2005 Ford F-250 single cab, long bed truck. And we paid like $5,500 for it. Right. And I'm like, so big F-250, tw uh, granted, it's like an 18-year-old truck. It's good for a 17-year-old first car trucking. for his business. Yeah, it's fine. It's a good work truck. But then I go four grand to watch movies. Yeah, I, that's that's exactly it. I think that the value proposition is there, but at this point, it, it's it's not a it's they, they they can't fulfill it. But at the same time, and this is why people get frustrated with Apple, and and I can totally understand it because it it frustrates me. They said that there were going to only be like sixty to eighty thousand units available at launch. Yeah, but apparently they sold through like. 160 or 180 thousand units in no yeah that's that ming chi Kuo, who is a, a trusted apple information person uh says that they, they would they, never try to create increased demand by painting a picture that there's not enough for people to no. get well no of course not because that would be i i mean i don't know if it's unethical or not but it's certainly misleading but that means that Almost 200,000 people on a wing and a prayer. Spent uh, four grand. So yeah, spent four grand on, on this Apple Vision Pro. And uh, let me do some math. So let's say they sold 150,000 units, right? Yeah. Times, let's say 4,000. God, it's $600 million. Yeah, $600 million. Now, of One course, day. you know, you can't really say like, okay, so all 600 million of those dollars have already been spent. You know, oh, yeah. I mean, in R &D, R &D, development, and... marketing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, so, still, that's that's real nice when you're Tim Cook and you wake up in your bank account and you go, all right, I got some of it back. Yeah. But here's the thing that that like worries me. It also came out that a lot of the lower level engineers and, and folks that were working on Vision Pro were very, very adamant that they wait until it was more mature and it had I think more smart, but they wanted to get it out. But uh, all the way up the chain, including, I, I, from what I understand, a very Tim Cook was like, "Nope, we're going." I don't you know care. If, I really if, think about right now. I wish that we had this on your soundboard. Like, if we thought about this before, we're, we're spruce things up here a little bit. Yeah, uh, we have some sounds now. Uh, as you noted at the beginning of the show, there was some music. Yeah, uh, I'm getting hair plugs next week. I mean, we're really trying <laughs> to make things better around here. But you know that Bill O'Reilly clip from a long time is like, F it. We'll go yeah, ahead. yeah, yeah. That I'll have to source that so we can have it on a little soundboard because sometimes, sometimes, I mean, I, I have a feeling that the same kind of conversation was had when the first Galaxy Fold was going to be released, right? They're like, maybe you should wait a few more months. Yeah, these test models are not work like they're breaking. We go. We'll do it live. Maybe that's the way headway is made in in the upper echelons of, of humanity, but we'll see. Well, now we're in a wait and see. I think that for me, again, really, really, really bullish on the product itself. I hope they didn't shoot themselves in the foot by saying, you know what, we'll just release it with like the few features that it can do. I don't know. And, we'll find out. And, I'm, I might crowdfund one next week. Yeah, we'll not. Let's not go there. For me, I think six months from now, I will reassess unless, unless like it, People get it in their hands in a week and they're like, oh my God, it's the most amazing thing. So I have mixed feelings about this. I, I don't want to ding anybody. I, I don't want to say anything bad about how anybody does business. That's not who I am. But when you see these videos and you see everything's just excitement, 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 like this, everyone's like amazing. And it's like, all you're doing is like watching a movie. I'm like, I, I want to know from somebody who gets this saying, like, if you had one, like I would be very, very anxious waiting to see what your thoughts are because like what is a practical experience and perspective with this is all of the all the excitement and right. the ginned up youtube stuff removed from it i will say so i i watched a couple of videos you know kind of still on the fence about whether or not i was going to spend the money i watched a, a cnet video so i guess the the people that had the most access to the vision pro they got access to it on four different occasions the fourth access they were allowed to publish their impressions, 
right? So I watched, I think it was CNET, and then I Justine did uh, a, an impressions video about her experience with it after, you know, four sessions. Mm. And as enthusiastic as she always is about Apple products, and she is enthusiastic about it, she was still kind of like, yeah, but we'll have to wait and see mm. on, on a lot of the different things that she was saying. She wasn't negative. That, that right there tells me enough that, like, there's just probably not enough to justify this on day one for most right. people. Like some yeah. people look, I know money for some people grows on trees, like money. Some people look at it and they go $4,000, I'll buy two. Uh, but I think people more in the discerning category of purchase making like you and I and many of our followers, we want to make sure that we're getting our money's worth out of something. And yeah. like maybe a good inflection point is six months from now to reassess and go, okay, how much like is there 50,000 more apps do we have this on there now is this exclusive has it created this new experience that just is revolutionary there's just a lot of questions out there and they may be answered yeah and and i i think whenever whenever you're being sold something and the details of what you're being sold are very obfuscated vague like that throws up a big caution flag for me and i wanted to be a, an early adopter i wanted to make a ton of videos about this product. I, you know, I was sort of like halfway planning to like make a cornerstone of the first half of my 2024 be Apple Vision Pro coverage. And I think those videos would have done relatively well. Probably, yeah. But I just, you know, it like the outlay versus the the utility just made me nervous. So as you should be when spending $4,000. Yeah. And I don't know if it'll ever go down in price. The only thing that I hope is that it goes up in utility. Yes. That it goes up in, in like, in realizing its promise. And, and I'm not saying that I might, wouldn't spend $4,000 on these one day, but it has to be shown to me that there's $4,000 of value there before I'm willing to spend that money. Right. Right. So we'll wait and see how this all goes. And and I don't know. I, I like to be bullish on Apple products, especially when they're being aspirational, when they're trying to do you something. They're very good. Yeah. Like they have a great track record for making good, new revolutionary products. Yeah. And you can go back in their history and look at things like the iPad or even the iPhone, uh, the Apple Watch, and see that those were product categories that hadn't really been established, even though they might there might have been other products that existed. Mm -hmm. And those those devices solidified those product categories as viable, right? And they did, but also if you take a look at the first Apple Watch, battery life was pretty crappy, didn't have tons of cool features and stuff. But by the time we got to the Apple Watch 3 and then like the 5, like they really started building it out in ways that I don't think a lot of people anticipated that you could do all that with a watch. So I think we'll have a very similar process here, but as our good friend Bon Jovi would say, we're only halfway there. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I I think with the Apple Watch, it's a good point. The Apple Watch 3 seemed to be the inflection point where yep. it matured. And that's part of the reason why the Apple Watch 3 became the Apple Watch SE. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my wife still wears her Apple Watch SE. So it's the kind of thing that you, but you have to hit that inflection point. The, the first iPad was a chonker. It was huge yeah. and it was slow. And and it it just, you know, you could see the potential, but it, it wasn't all the way there. Uh, but now, you know, probably like the iPad Air is where they really hit their stride. And that was that was just two or three years later. So and it's been so successful at this point. We even have a, a budget Apple Pencil. I know. Only $80. Hard to believe. Well, I think that's a good place for us to, to kind of wind down because the, those are the two big things that have been going on. You know, we, we've got the Samsung, we've got the we've got the OnePlus, and of course, the Vision Pro. So we'll wind it's down an there. exciting week. I know, and it's only going to get better. Uh, I'm still kind of coming out of my, my COVID fog and, and holiday malaise, you know, not ready to all this crazy stuff. But hey, but, we did get to burn a lot of calories at CES, so we got to burn off a lot of that Christmas food. Yeah. Yeah, we did, uh, man, like twelve to 15,000 steps a day. That's a lot. Uh, yeah, I was I was clocking on average eight miles a day. Yeah, and, a oof, man, my right leg, just top to bottom. Not not good for that kind of thing anymore. But shakes over at Shake Shack were amazing. Yes. Yeah, they were so good that when I was stranded in the Denver airport, I went back and got myself the same meal that we had the day before. So and there's nothing wrong with that because it's good. 
It is good. And we don't have no Shay Shack out here. We do have the Freddy's though. Oh, Freddy's, Freddy's is good. Yeah, very Freddy's. similar. And they don't they have the concrete, you know, which is yeah. The, the so custard. those 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 custards are very good. But anyway, thanks folks for being here. Uh once again, this has been the Painfully Honest Tech Podcast. Let's let's listen to the theme music again. Oh yeah. The podcast So Honest It Hurts. My name is Jason, sometimes known as the JTL. We've got Adam. Check out on his regular channel tech odyssey down in the description below we've got some other stuff that you can check out and do that please go watch our other stuff because that's why we're here but until the next time uh we are out